approach Equality Day on August 26th, coming up, we celebrate 95 years since the passage of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution that gave women the right to vote in 1920. So join me tonight in honoring the suffragists of Liberty Grove, as you do every time you go vote, especially the ladies. I should point out that suffragette, which is a very commonly used term, is considered demeaning to American women in the, in the women's rights movement because it infers that we are militant like our British sisters. We prefer the term suffragist. It means anyone, male or female, who believes that all people, male and female, should have an equal right to vote. So when you get in an argument with somebody, that's what the big issue is. Plus, we all know the song, Suffragette, you know. Um, now, Wisconsin can be very proud that it was the very first state to ratify the 19th Amendment mm -hmm. on June 10th, 1919. Some of your grannies and your great grannies join me in fighting for equality, and I hope you continue to do it in your lifetime because the fight's not over. By their action of voting in 1921, I choose to honor the Liberty Grove women tonight who signed in to vote under their husband's name by using their first and their maiden names. Now, when John Adams and our forefathers headed off to write our very first constitution in 1776, his wife, Abigail Smith Adams said, John, remember the ladies, <laughs> or they will torment a rebellion. And it was a little delay in it happening, but Abigail knew that society's values and man's need for control and power probably would keep woman in her place, at home and on a pedestal because politics is a dirty business. Legally, women were considered property in Wisconsin as it wrote its state constitution in 1848. One legislator, legislator was liberated. He said, it's slavery more lasting than that of blacks in the hearts and prejudices of people. But sadly, he was a lone voice in the wilderness and the majority of the legislators did not take any risk, didn't change anything, and kept the guys in power. The editor of the Milwaukee Sentinel wrote, women are confessively angels and angels don't vote. <laughs> what idealism. How many people here are angels? How many of you vote? <laughs> I mean, be real. Despite the courage of the pioneer women, the bravery of the immigrant women who left their home shores, usually with a bunch of little kids in tow, the strength and intelligence of the women that ran the farms and businesses, both at, in peace and in war. <coughs> you know, the equal rights struggle would take time and persistence. <coughs> These strong-minded women here in Liberty Grove were opinionated and staunch in their faith and beliefs. When I went around and met some of the, their ancestors, that was the first thing they always said. They were opinionated. <laughs> and they were strong. People like Mary Erickson Sequist, Anna Kellstrom Apple, Annie Bunda Highlander, Inez Wallace Telfer, and Olga Olson Wickman. And after the Civil War, women were finally allowed to vote in school-related elections. And they could even run for office in school, you know, for school boards and things like that. They had to run on a separate ballot, though. And our state, in its great wisdom, in the usual, life is not fair, they didn't print the separate ballots. And that took care of business for the women and kept them in their place. Now, Clara Colby, valedictorian of the first University of Wisconsin class to admit women in 1869, urged, every vote cast for suffrage is a victory over ancient customs prejudice and conservatism gained by education and agitation. 
<laughs> 16 years later, Wisconsin became the 13th state to have some form of woman suffrage. But when 200 Sturgeon Bay women decided to vote the next year and make sure that they had that right, it was ruled they could only vote in school-related meetings, not the general meeting, the election. And in that group was Eliza Coleman Nelson. She was married to a banker who soon after that big rebellion in Sturgeon Bay um, died. And what was she going to do? How was she going to survive? She headed up the Liberty Grove and taught at Newport School, where Uncle Tom's is now. At the turn of the century, Wisconsin entered the progressive era under Governor Robert La Follette and his suffragist <coughs> lawyer wife, Belle Case. He hired more women in governmental support position, and school suffrage was actually working. It had been stagnant for 65 years since statehood, and they sub the younger women were ready to agitate. They submitted suffrage bills every single year from 1882 to 1912. So when we talk about persistence, it is a long, long fight. Number two. Danger. Danger. Women's suffrage will double the irresponsible vote. Oh, come on. <laughs> Immigrants are not irresponsible. Liberty Grove were very happy to be here. They, this was their life. They had committed everything to make a new life. And many of them came to America to escape governments that told them what religion they had to be, like Anders Sequist. And um, they were getting away from these strong, domineering um, monarchies in, the, in Europe. So education was the key to responsible votes. Three. It's a menace to the home, men's employment, and to all businesses. Oh. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> Boo. Liberty Grove women had started businesses as simple as Annie Kellstrom Apple bringing her butter and eggs down to the corner by the Sister Bay Bowl every Friday afternoon. And when she wasn't doing that, she made money attaching leeches to her neighbors to lower blood pressure. Oh. <laughs> Anna Johnson Larson contributed to the economy as a midwife and practical nurse. Emma Kepsel and so Ann Schultz Kepsel started her roadside stand and it's grown into a booming business now. Um, Anna Happy <coughs> Grassy is believed to be one of the first female cheesemakers in Door mm -hmm. County and maybe Wisconsin. I just mm -hmm. found that out yesterday or two <coughs> days ago. More commonly, widows like Mary uh, Waracek Bunda had to continue operating their husband's businesses, the family farm, because if they didn't, all would fail and their family would be left isolated. So it's not a man menace, it's a necessity, <laughs> sir. <laughs> now, whether you're from Liberty Grove or elsewhere, some of your grannies and foremothers helped women gain the vote. But the big question is, did the men of your family support them and believe in suffrage? Did they really think they were going to vote whichever way they told their wife to vote? I don't think so. But on the frontier and in rural areas, American men relied on their spouses, their helpmates, to survive. It was about survival. But there's a big change going on in Liberty Grove. People are coming here to visit and the vacationers are showing up. Like Bob Murray's <laughs> father at six years old in 1912. Was his mother a Chicago suffragist? They were very active in Chicago. Um, and there were also many Liberty Grove love stories. 
Yvonne, the cherry picker that we met last time, fell in love with Paul Voigt. <laughs> and she was from the other side of Green Bay, you know, across the water. And Joe Slackey was a tourist with his family and fell in love with Dottie Telfer. You know, you get these new ideas and the women are no longer going to be the drudge in the kitchen, the puppet in the parlor, or the toy of man. <laughs> the last thing a man becomes progressive about is the activities of his own wife. Oh. <laughs> and yet, ladies, if you all belong to your church, Ladies Aid Society, you're raising funds for buildings and for your church mission. And gentlemen, how many of your churches let the women be members and vote? Not too many in Liberty Grove. Hmm. That's what I call Lady Aid. <laughs> <laughs> now, young women, you know, you got to watch these feisty young women. They organized the Political Equality League. And they decided they were going to go public. They were going to educate. And the people loved it. They were going to see the spectacle and be entertained. And when Buffalo Bill Cody came riding into Green Bay for his Wild West show, he was carrying a suffrage banner. And every county fair and state fair was passing out yellow balloons with votes for women. Hmm. labeled on them. Because 1912 was a, a pivotal year. A statewide referendum campaign was going to take the vote to the men. And it was, you guys, your chance to vote and support your woman, your the women in your lives, and change things. So under the leadership of Mrs. Elizabeth Hansen Dreitzer, the chair of the Women's Suffrage Work in Door County, an automobile caravan pulled into Sister Bay 103 years ago. That June morning, they had spoken in Valmy, Jacksonport, and Bailey's Harbor, and they had a two o'clock appointment to speak in front of Bundus. Now, I don't know how much you know about uh, Sister Bay's history, but within a couple of weeks, most of Sister Bay was going to burn down. Mm -hmm. And Mary Warachek Bunda is a widow and a postmistress, and she's now facing a business that is destroyed by fire. And she said, maybe women don't have the vote yet, but we know how to work, to be strong, and to provide for our families. And she started rebuilding. The vote will come from my daughter and granddaughters, and I will be proud. Those kind of leaders are the ones that inspired not only her neighbors, but especially her children. And her daughter, Annie Bunda Hill and Highlander, said her mom was an ambitious woman who seemed always to run rather than walk. <laughs> and there's a Mary R. Bunda who did run for school superintendent in 1923. And if anybody knows stories about that, I'd love to know more details. Now, in this auto uh, campaign uh, parade that was coming into town, lawyers Mr. and Mrs. McCullough drove up from Chicago for a family vacation. You know, if you're going to go out and rabble rouse, you should have a little vacation. And their children were with them, and they were joined by local automobile delegation that included speakers from New York and Green Bay. They spoke from the auto, and there was no difficulty hearing every word before the small groups. But you have to wonder, were there hecklers? It was a Thursday afternoon at 2 o'clock. How many people were there? Catherine Waugh McCullough said... The most important reason why women should have the right to vote is that they need the ballot for their own protection from crime, disease, starvation, <coughs> ignorance, and manifold other dangers. 47-year-old President Mary Erickson Sequist and the ladies of the Sister Bay Women's Christian Temperance Union met the delegation with open arms. That's their mission, to fight those exact things that Catherine was talking about. 
Based on current research, she was probably uh, joined by Elida Sequist Anderson, Amelia Highlander Anderson, Anna Kellstrom Appel, and Amanda Highlander Lundquist. And they served luncheon to that auto delegation. Women from the Baptist, Lutheran, and Moravian churches were all part of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And it was a large national organization that served as a training ground for women that saw a need for better laws and more protection. The women's club served that same purpose. Down in Sturgeon Bay, there was a women's club, but it wouldn't be until 1930 that Ellison Bay organized their women's club. But it was organized by people like <coughs> that, who were avid um, voters. Magdalene Olson Clunky and her sister Olga Olson Wickman and Inez Wallace Telfer. All three had been raised outside of Door County and may have already been part of a woman's club or knew of their activities elsewhere. Now, although the WCTU saw women's voting power as a means to protect women and children from biased laws and the evils of demon rum, <laughs> we must remember that this was a time when men had a near dominion, uh, excuse me, near domination over their house and their home. A woman could not retain her own er earnings, neither sue nor be sued. She could not be given custody of her minor children, nor will or inherit property. And before 1859, she couldn't even own property or enter into contracts. Drunken fathers and husbands at this time were governed by the rule of thumb. A husband could beat his wife with anything smaller than the thickness of his thumb. This was across America and in Great Britain as well. Another problem, Wisconsin brewers and liquor interests seduced, I love that word, <laughs> seduced and controlled the legislature. Over drinks, of course. <laughs> and when the married property, woman's property rights were considered, we heard... It will destroy the character of a wife. <laughs> <laughs> it will violate express commands in the Bible. <laughs> Mother, Mother mends my socks and shirts. Mother mends my coat. Maybe she could mend some laws if she had the vote. <laughs> Our foremother slowly emerged from the data of the Liberty Grove town meeting poll list from 1885 to 1932 at the town hall. And from church records. They're very interesting. No other voting record list exists in Liberty Grove because Wisconsin has a very important preservation law that any place that has less than 5,000 people don't have to keep their registration list. And this, I spoke to people at State, in Sturgeon Bay, and it's very interesting. Um, sadly, we don't know what the women at said or thought, unless you have a family journal or letters from the woman herself. So we can only search for a record of their actions and how they influenced their family and friends. Seven Sequist women, five Highlander women, and four Whitman women would encourage others to use their new power to vote in 1921. Surely, their husbands and fathers and hopefully brothers and uncles all voted in 1912 to pass the referendum. Of the six women who voted in 1921, uh, six of the women were immigrants and aware that Swedish women could vote for local elections in 1909, Norwegian women the following year, and Norway became the first independent country in the world to give women the right to vote in general elections in 1913. Um, so America was a year behind trying to get their act together. And when Don's grandmother, 
Barrett, Peter's daughter, Overby showed up. Do you think your grandfather, John, voted for the referendum for suffrage? Was he a believer in women's rights? Well, if he did in Norway, he gave him the rights in Norway, so I assume he would have. And I bet you Barrett made sure he did. <laughs> <laughs> now, trying to get into Liberty Grove woman's life is, is difficult from the far future. But Mary Erickson tells her story in her son John Sequist's book, Pioneer Experiences in Door County. Have any of you read it? Well, it's available at the library in Sister Bay. And she said this, it gives us a flavor of what life was like in Door County. I was only about 13 when the Chicago boat dropped us in Bailey's Harbor. Mother and I and my younger siblings trudged that hot, muggy day from Bailey's Harbor to Sister Bay. And then we still had to walk to Three Springs, where my father had readied a cabin for us the year before. We struggled with our burdens according to our size and strength because it was everything we owned since we came from Sweden when I was only seven, so it had been about six years, and what we'd accumulated in Chicago. Father was a carpenter and builder, so you can imagine our dismay at the rude log cabin surrounded by stumps before us. Later that night, my exhausted 34-year-old mother sat crying at this new challenge in her life. There was little I could do either. I had hope and faith that our life would improve now that we owned property. School was only three miles away and I was looking forward to attending it. However, I ended up with little formal education and thirsted for knowledge. Whenever possible, I read books and later encouraged my children to learn as much as they could. On Sundays, we socialized at the new Swedish Baptist Church founded by Anders Sequist, which helped us all weather the storms of our lives here in the new land. Within three years, I fell in love with his son and my friend, Carl Robert Sequist, who started Sunday school at church. Now, as we planned our future together, I needed a dowry. So I found a position as a domestic at, with the Wheeler family back in Chicago and we wrote letters back and forth making our plans so that we could marry in 1886. Sadly, we only had 40 years together and Robert passed away in 1926, but I relied on my children and my faith to keep me going. And remember, she is the president of the WCTU and the only woman that I have documentation that she was a true committed suffragist. Now, another window on woman's life would be Alice Brand's new book, well, relatively new book, Just South of Heaven. And she tells about what her mother's day was like, Amanda Highlander Lundquist. And so that's quite an interesting read as well. So, after all that is said and done, what happened to the referendum in 1912 on November 10th? Do you think it passed? Uh -uh. Over 90% of the male voters cast separate ballots on the issue and were defeated, two to one. The Antis campaign, the liquor lobby, and the poor immigrant turnout in the state where three-fourths of our population in Wisconsin were immigrants, really defeated the, the whole issue. So maybe your foremothers weren't suffragists, maybe they were Antis. Despite the defeat, however, it rejuvenated the effort, and you can just imagine some of the discussions at home. <laughs> Lavinia Goodell, the first Wisconsin woman admitted to the bar in 1874, explained, So many timid ladies are afraid they shall do something unwomanly. <laughs> and suffragist Theodora Yeoman said, the greatest effect of women's suffrage is its influence upon the woman herself. So what are we going to do, ladies? It was a time of great decision. Nationally, the National American Women's Suffrage Association 
decided on a winning plan. The time had come, it was 1919, and the new leader was Carrie Chapman Catt from Griffin, Wisconsin. So those Wisconsin ladies, they got in there. The fight would be won state by state, and World War I also helped because there were terrible inequalities as the women covered for the men and the doughboys came home and the ladies went back to their proper place at home. On a pedestal if they were lucky, but most of them back to home. School teachers were well aware of the power of educated voters. Cheap school committees, Anybody on the school committee? I'm sorry if I... <laughs> uh, often hired female teachers because there was no equal pay for equal work then, and we're hardly there yet, but we're getting there. And education really did open the door for young ladies and old ladies, like widows and anybody that needed a job. One gentleman was happy they were gaining, women were gaining organizational skills in the classroom. Because if you've ever known an unorganized teacher, you know it's chaos. <laughs> but this guy said, women became comfortable with the sound of their own voice in their classroom. And that was the end. In 1917, the State Teachers Convention voted to support suffrage. And meanwhile, here in Liberty Grove, Verna LeClaire, a teacher from Jacksonport, is the very first woman found on the Liberty Grove poll list on April 1st, 1919. Perhaps she was there to vote for Catherine Colony, uh, Conley, excuse me, Door County School Superintendent, who received 164 votes out of 166 voters. Mm -hmm. So she was popular and she was reelected many times. And did great things for Door County Schools. It's an interesting story in and of itself. Now, Verna may also have been acting as an example to her students and their parents, and probably politicking, because she was the District 1 school principal at the big salary of $55 a school month. She would continue to teach the upper grades and she got to be the janitor. <laughs> and she made $178 every school month, which was a really good job for women in that time and place. The big mystery is why didn't she vote in 1920? She was there in 1919. Why didn't she vote in 1920, 1921? Well, I believe she got married to Mr. Muller and left town. So there's more of that story that needs to be found. Only two known female teachers voted in 1921 after the passage of national suffrage. Olga Olson Whitman and Alma uh, Whittleson. Is that how you say it here? Whittleson? Whittleson. 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 Um, many of you had Olga as a teacher and have told me that she expected students to be their best and don't mess around. <laughs> but keep our country strong and do your job. And most of the Liberty Grove suffrages attended school programs, were very active in the PTA meetings, and many of the husbands were school board members. And so that was very important. Education is the key. We don't know if any Liberty Grove women cast their ballot in the national election in 1920, which they legally could, and they would have been voting for or against Warren G. Hun Harding, return to normalcy. So the guys probably thought it's never gonna be normal again. <laughs> well, no, but 33 women voted at our town meeting in 1921. And I bet they didn't all vote like their husbands told them to. <laughs> they were on an average of 30 years old. Um, six were single, one widowed. 11 were the next generation after the fight for 1912 referendum vote. And at least 12 were Baptists, 10 were Lutherans, six Moravians, revealing ladies' networking uh, patterns. But you know, life gets in the way even today when it's time to go vote. Maybe a baby 
illness at home or other family responsibilities kept them away from the polls. So this kind of uh, analysis is fairly weak because we only have the town elections in April. By 1921, the legislature had passed the first Equal Rights Bill, granting the same rights and privileges that you gentlemen have had since day one in this country. Although that's improved. You know, you get to vote younger along the way. The only problem was there were all these special protections and privileges which were protecting the general welfare, you know. It's kind of what's happening now in your lifetime. You get a little law here, a little law there. It doesn't protect you solidly, but it backfired for the women because you couldn't even get a job for the legislature because of the eight hour a day work rule. So these special protections didn't make you equal, it made you separate but equal. Women could now sign contracts and choose their place of residence. They could serve on gen juries. They could hold and sell property and obtain custody of their children. Inez Wallace Telfer was strong-minded enough that when the authorities told her she couldn't serve hot lunches to the POW prisoner, uh, the prisoners of war that were picking for their farm, she did it anyway. She made a big pot of soup or stew or beans and fed them because it was right. And I think that's one thing we know from the voting record of these early suffragists. They voted for what they believed was right and was going to make the world a better place, or at least their life. Antis continued to challenge Cat and the League of Women voters until 1922. And they continue to fight the Equal Rights Amendment movement today. Larry Nelson's grandmother, Alma Beckstrom Nelson, became a committed voter in 1924 when three women were elected to the Wisconsin legislature. And over 400 women held municipal offices across the state of Wisconsin. If we jump ahead a little 50 years, in 72, Wisconsin ratified the Equal Rights Amendment, but three states are still needed to pass this amendment so that women have equal protection under the law of the U.S. Constitution. And that fight continues, so that's up to your generation. And when Abigail Adams said, remember the ladies, we still need to remember the ladies. Our life might be wonderful in the place we're at right now, but there are lots of women that are still treated as second-class citizens. So it's up to your generation to finish the task. Now, this research that I did was lots of fun, and it helped me learn about Liberty Grove and the intricacies of a small community where everybody's related to everybody else. <laughs> and, and not only related, but dependent upon. I mean, it's a community. And so I encourage you to share your family tree and stories with the Liberty Grove Historical Society. Do an oral history before it's too late. Write down some memories of your own for your children and your grandchildren. And don't throw things away before you check with Jake.